Hello, it's Randy Rhodes. Here's a clip from our show, and go to randyrhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a single podcast. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fall. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream to be. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. Do you think he's a role model to children in the United States? No. You don't? No, absolutely not. Uh, I think that, you know, of the things that are happening right now that are, that are harmful to our nation, um, whether it's the breaking down of we're going to be doing some hearings on some of the things that he purposely is breaking down relationships we have around the world that have been useful to our nation, but I think at the end of the day, when his term is over, I think the debasing of our nation, um, oh my God. the constant non-truth telling, the, <laughs> just the, the name calling, the things like, I think the, the debasement of our nation will be what he'll be remembered most for, and, and that's regretful. Um, um, and it affects young people. I mean, we have young people who, for the first time, are you know, watching a president uh, stating, uh, you know, absolute non-truths, uh, non-stop, um, personalizing things in the way that he does, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's very sad for our nation. Oh, my God. Bob Corker got uncorked this morning and uh, went out there, went out front and center, and said the president is debasing the country, the president is uh, putting the country under threat, uh, the president is a liar, so, except uh, Corker says he doesn't use the L word. So he just said demonstrably untrue and that everybody up here knows uh, that what he says is untrue because it's easily uh, fact-checked. It's, easy, it's easily known by us. Uh, I mean, th- that's how this morning started. And uh, then, of course, I don't know if you know, but the president was, uh, well, he went to Capitol Hill today to discuss his uh, tax breaks for the very wealthy and everybody after Bob Corker started the day off calling the president, uh, you know, uh, dangerous, uh, a liar, uh, somebody who debases this nation, somebody who is risking our standing in the world and our security in the world. I mean, I don't think Republicans say these things lightly, but after he said all that uh, and he did say all that, uh, let, let me just uh, play you the first clip that uh, this is what happened this morning. Manu Raju was... Um, following Bob Corker this morning in the hallway in the Senate, and uh, they were going to go to uh, this room. I've been in this room, actually, for a meeting with the senators, and uh, they were going to this room in the Senate right off the floor, and they uh, knew that the president was coming up to Capitol Hill, uh, and they were very, very upset because they're trying to pay for tax cuts for the wealthy. Do not think that the Republicans are your friends. They're not your friends. What their goal here was, was they were trying to uh, reduce taxes for the uber wealthy. They want a $500 billion tax cut, f- cut for corporations. Uh, some of them don't want to add to the deficit. And this tax plan, as it stands, adds $1.5 trillion to the deficit. So they were looking at middle class tax cuts and they were looking to take them away from us. Okay. Remember, I told you yesterday that they had gone after our 401k contributions. That's 50 million middle class Americans that put money in their 401ks, including me. And so what we're allowed to put away currently is $18,000 a year pre-tax, meaning that money comes right out of your paycheck. The remainder of your paycheck is taxed, but the amount that you're contributing to your retirement is not. So you could put up to $18,000 a year away. Well, if you're over 50, they say, okay, time to really save hard. You could put $24,000 pre-tax in your 401k. The Republicans were looking to take that number down that we could put into our retirement pre-tax down to $2,400. It's insane. But that would have saved them $119 billion, and they're looking to cobble together $1.5 trillion. They've got this $4 trillion tax cut that they're jamming into this $1.5 trillion package. And then they need to write off the $1.5 trillion. So they're going after your local and state tax deduction, your mortgage deduction, your charitable deduction, the pre-tax uh, money that you could set aside for yourself in your 401k. And, of course, they want to get rid of your subsidies on Obamacare because, you know, that's money, too. Uh, they want to cut Medicaid. They want to cut Medicare by $470 billion, all to pay for this tax cut. So they're not your friends, Okay. 
Trump tweets out that your 401k won't be touched. That, 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 we won't do that. We won't do that. And the Republicans lose their minds because they're trying to keep this on the QT. They're trying to keep this quiet so that they can just ram through these tax cuts and uh, the very wealthy, uh, you know, the, the Koch brothers, the Mercer family. I mean, these families would get $50 billion worth of tax relief just in the estate tax repeal. So you're talking about a handful of families would get 30 to $50 billion in tax cuts. This is pissing off the Republicans that Trump is tweeting, no, 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 we won't do that to 50 million Americans. We won't take away their ability to save in their 401k. And the Republicans are losing their minds, okay, because they want these tax cuts because they know that if they don't get these tax cuts through after their failure on Obamacare because they didn't want to take away, uh, you know, uh, the health care from 20 million Americans, which is what the CBO said their plan would do, so they said, okay, we can't do that. We'll be killed in 2018. So now they want these tax cuts because they know if they fail, they'll be killed in 2018. It's all about politics for them. So Bob Corker goes ahead today and comes uncorked and starts, uh, you know, uh, trashing the president because the president is tweeting things and uh, just proceeds to, uh, you know, lay out the case against the president and his unbelievable amount of flip-flopping, lying. Uh, his word means nothing. Uh, we can't work with him. Uh, you know, he's proved himself to be unable to rise to the occasion of being president, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Check this Nothing out. Nothing that he said in his tweets today uh, were truthful. You know, I read it. He knows it. And people around him know it. I, I would hope the staff over there would figure out ways of controlling him when they know that everything he said today was absolutely untrue. I mean, so. you said he's an untruthful president. Yeah, Are you no calling question. him? Are there, no question. Yeah, no question. I mean, I don't. We grew up in our family not using the L word, okay. Uh, and But, yeah, just, uh, I mean, they're provable untruths. Provable. Um, so, I mean, on the Iran deal, everybody knows the role I played there. And they're working with me, interestingly, right now um, on, uh, on tax reform. I made the deal with Toomey that... You know, has allowed that to go forward. Um, obviously, I want to make sure it's done properly. But and then everything else. I mean, four times he encouraged me to run and told me he would endorse me. So I, I don't know. It's it's amazing. Unfortunately, I think world leaders are very aware that um, much of what he says is untrue. Uh, certainly, people here are because these things are provably untrue. I mean, just they're just. Mm factually incorrect and people know the difference so i don't know why he lowers himself uh to such a low low standard and debases our country in the way that he does but he does and uh you know look i don't like responding i, I you know you can let him go unanswered but uh, uh and it's just not me to we don't do tweets like that we've responded twice to again untruths but uh you know, it's unfortunate that our nation finds itself um, in this place. Is the so. president of the United States a liar? The president uh, has great difficulty with the truth Whew. on many issues. Do you regret supporting him in the election? Uh, well, let's just put it this way. I would not do that again. So. You, you wouldn't support him no, again? No way. Uh -huh. no, wow. No, I, I think that uh, he's proven himself... Uh, unable to rise to the occasion i think many of us me and me included have you know tried to you know i've intervened i've had private dinner I've, you know I've been with him on multiple occasions to try to you know, create some kind of aspirational uh, uh, approach if you will to the way that he conducts himself but uh, i don't think that that's possible and um, I, he's obviously not going to to rise to the occasion as president Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's how the morning started, okay? That was early this morning. That, uh, Bob Corker was walking through the Senate office buildings. And, of course, Donald Trump was scheduled and did go. Uh, they had a lunch meeting scheduled on Capitol Hill to discuss the tax breaks. And... Um, Everybody uh, was, I mean, the media just fanned out. They were covering, uh, you know, his arrival to Capitol Hill and say, oh, my God. Uh, one of the, Senator Tillerson, uh, or Tillerson, what's his name? 
Uh, he went and got some popcorn because he wanted to watch the fight between Corker and McCain and Ben Sass, who has questioned uh, Donald Trump's uh, devotion to the Constitution, especially the First Amendment. After all, the NFL tweeting went on. Uh, you had, uh, uh, you know, uh, Senator Mark Kirk from Illinois. Uh, Trump called him a loser and they went at each other. And of course, you've got the legendary fight between John McCain. You had Susan Collins on a hot mic the other day saying that she thinks the president is unstable. She's from Frightened for the country. She doesn't think that he's uh, stable enough to be the president. So you had all this, but then Bob Corker actually decided ahead of this lunch, he would fan out and go to every single news outlet. He went to uh, Good Morning America. He, I think he did everything but The View. I mean, he did every damn show uh, that there is this morning. Uh, to talk about how the president is lying about the tax cuts, he went to George Stephanopoulos. He to take any reform of 401ks off the table. Are you confident he's got the will and the skill and the commitment to get this done? Uh, George, I, I haven't seen that yet. There's about $4 trillion in loophole closings, uh, credits, uh, all kinds of things that you're very familiar with in tax code that have to be closed in order to do what has been laid out. And so there's, you know, it's easy to talk about cutting people's rates and doing this, that the things that benefit people, but the spinach, if you will, is in doing all of these reforms, which make filling out your taxes much more simple and which is what the American people have asked for for years. But if you start taking things off the table, before you get started, you make that very difficult. And so what I hope is going to happen is the president will leave this effort, if you will, to the tax writing committees, let them do their work and not begin taking things off the table that ought to be debated in these committees um, at the proper time. You see, I tell you, the thing with the 401ks is that the Senate is trying to undermine the middle class as best as they can in order to give these tax cuts to the rich. And so uh, Trump keeps taking things off the table because he realizes it makes him look like, uh, you know, uh, uh, who he is, you know, a guy trying to give tax breaks to the wealthy. And so he's tweeting, uh, you know, up the storm going, no, no, we're not going to do this. And no, no, we're not going to take away your state and local tax. Return. No, we're not going to take away your mortgage deduction. No, we're not going to take away your charitable deduction. And then yesterday, uh, you know, I tried to explain to you very quickly that it came out that they were going to take away our 401k contributions or at least lower them down to only 2400 a year we could set aside instead of the 18000 which is the greatest middle class tax break uh, for retirement that ever was devised. And they're going to throw us into these IRAs, uh, you know, Roth IRAs. And those uh, you have to pay taxes on the money and then you could put them in the IRA. So anyway, this is what got uh, Bob Corker all upset. But man, did he trash the president. Uh, he just called him every name he could. The fitness of the president. What are your concerns about this president? Well, look, I this is uh, I've gotten to know the president in a very unique way over the course of the last year. And uh, I guess like all Americans, I would have hoped that he would rise to the occasion and bring out the best in our nation. Charlie, uh, hopefully what presidents do is to try to bring the country together, to unify around common goals and, uh, and not to debase our country, if you will. And that has not happened. And I'm beginning to believe that it's not going to happen. And I think that's what uh, President Bush, President Obama, many others have been concerned about as it, it appears to be the governing model of this White House to purposely divide. I mean, that's what happened after the Virginia incident. Mm. Uh, it's to consolidate base, not to bring people together and to bring out the better angels of those people in our country. This is a great nation. And without us doing that, it really not only affects us and future generations, but it affects the world. And so I hope I don't really hold out a lot of hope, but I hope that somehow uh, a little bit different course of action can be taken. Looks like Bob Corker has had enough of this president's lying only because it's getting in the way of them redistributing the wealth back to, oh, well, from us to the very wealthy Americans, which is what the Republican Party is there for. So while what Bob Corker says about the president is demonstrably true, he is unfit, he is unstable, he is not a suitable role model for children, he lies. He doesn't take uh, the blame for anything. He has no tax plan. He has none. And that's, this is what's frustrating them, really. They have had enough. Now, the 
tape about grabbing women and, you know, blah, that wasn't enough for them. Calling Mexican rapists, that wasn't enough for them. The lying that he did on the campaign trail, the calling of Hillary Clinton, you know, to be locked up, that wasn't it. hiring Flynn as national security advisor when he was really a Russian agent. That was now they've had enough. It's the taxes. <laughs> Commercial free, on demand, whenever, wherever listening experience. Visit randyrhodes.com for your personal premium podcast today. Yeah, you could buy tile at a chain store if you wanted to. You could wait for a kid to try and answer your questions about what's this made of or how do I install it or what's in stock. But what if you wanted serious craftsmanship? What if you wanted custom design, handmade, to order from your imagination or an inspiration photo that you love. Probably you think you can't anymore, but I did. When it was time to shop tile, I came across a family-owned business that still handcrafts each and every individual tile, matching your colors, your inspiration, your design. Tempest Tile Works. They're based in Portland, Oregon, and they still handcraft the most magnificent tile. Let them match to your fabrics or to your countertops or to anything you can envision for your bath or kitchen. Teeny tiny tiles to oversized their art or yours it's all doable it's all affordable and it's all individually made just for your project visit tempest tile works and look at their amazing gallery of designs and styles and give up the chain stores tempest tile works custom made tempesttileworks.com so let's see there's still no female president you make half of what men make yet somehow you are still expected to take care of most everything at the home too and ladies, you're beautiful, but on a daily basis, you look in the mirror in disgust at how you look. It is time to start a new routine, and I hope that you will listen to my new show, She Persisted, here on the Progressive Voices Network. My name is Melissa Carter. I will be your host, and I have been a media personality for over 20 years. I also came out on the air long before Ellen did, and as a single mom and a kidney transplant recipient, I have been through some shit. Nevertheless, I persisted. And I know you have too. So let's talk about what we've accomplished. And together, we can learn to take it from she persisted to she thrived. It's she persisted at 8 a.m. on the East on the Progressive Voices Network and on demand on the Progressive Voices app. I certainly hope you'll join me. This is the voice of the resistance. You're listening to the Progressive Voices Network. Dear fellow progressive, these are the times that try men's souls. It is not the first time our country has been in peril, and it won't be the last. It is, however, a unique threat from within, one the precise likes of which we have never seen before. It is our modern media mix that has enabled an incurious, unserious, pathological liar and textbook narcissist to accede to the highest office in the land. His is a world of make-believe one that could only have been concocted by a student of reality TV. At least we know he studied something. The imagined slights, the trumped up, pun intended, feuds, the insulting nicknames, the Twitter diarrhea, it is all of a piece. Entertaining, funny even, in another context, but when you're busy blowing up the country's longest running foreign relationships, devastating the environment, threatening trade wars, and embracing all the wrong actors, it's really hard to find the humor. At Progressive Voices, we take holding the powerful accountable is our most serious mission. And there is nothing more important to us today than making sure the PV audience is informed with unbiased information and that more and more people become part of our audience and therefore are better informed than they can be by relying solely on the mainstream media, which in so many ways has shrunk from its duty as the watchdog of democracy. It is our sincere hope that you will help us in this important mission at this most critical hour. Go to ProgressiveVoices.com and make your donation today. Please give whatever you can. Remember, we are a tax-exempt 501c3, meaning that your donations are fully tax-deductible. Thanks for supporting the Progressive Voices Network. Hi, it's Randy Rhodes. Listen to me on the PV live stream or on demand or both on the PV app. Just go to ProgressiveVoices.com or download the Progressive Voices app. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. 
Okay, we're not even current yet. Some other things have happened today, uh, but I just want to, uh, you know, show you what Bob Corker did before before this lunch. This must have been a doozy, a doozy of a lunch on Capitol Hill with the president and the Senate because stuff has happened. This was before the lunch. This was early this morning. Senator, um, you, you of course know that you've been in the news a bit for your criticism of the president. You have announced that you are not running for re-election. I've read what you said pretty carefully and among the comments you made is that you're concerned his comments, the president's comments, could put us on the path to World War III. Yeah. I, I, let me put it bluntly. Left to his own devices, do you think the president is a threat to national security? I think that there are people around him that uh, uh, work in an effort to contain him. That would be Secretary Mattis and Tillerson and, oh and General God. Kelly there as chief of staff. Well, that almost uh, seems to think, accept the premise of the question, if he needs to be contained. I, I do think when you have the kind of issue we're dealing with in North Korea, uh, where we have a very unstable leader there. Uh, when you send out tweets into the region to raise tensions, when you kneecap, uh, which is what he's done publicly, when you kneecap your Secretary of State, whose diplomacy you have to depend upon to really bring China to the table to do the things that need to be done, back-channeling in some cases uh, to North Korea. When you kneecap that effort, so, you really move our country into a binary choice, uh, which could lead to a world war. So, yes, oh. uh, I want him to support diplomatic efforts, not uh, embarrass and really malign oh. efforts that are underway to try to, to try to get some kind of diplomatic We're solution. Wow, this is really stunning, everybody. This is amazing. The corker becomes uncorked, and uh, he says that the president is a threat to national security. He says the th president is an embarrassment to us on the world stage. He has previously, uh, when he was uh, you know, caught early this morning, early, early this morning, walking down the hallway in the Senate by Manu Raju from CNN, he uh, says that the uh, president is not fit for children, uh, that the president is uh, unable to serve, that the president will never rise to the occasion to be the president, that everything he says is demonstrably false. Uh, you know, he does everything except use the L word because I told you, senators have a problem with the L word. They always did. You, there's this, uh, you know, old story I used to tell you. When I first started going up to the Senate, it was around 2003 or four, and uh, I was in a, um, a, a small gathering with uh, Senator Joe Biden, um, and he was talking to media folks, and I was, uh, you know, uh, one of them. And he, you know, it was, he, he made his presentation, and then he asked if anybody had any questions. And, of course, the room goes quiet. And, and I, you know, raised my hand. I said, yes. Uh, and he called on me. And I stood up and I said, um, you know, uh, with all due respect, Senator, can you tell me? And this is when Bush was president. And I said, can you tell me why you won't call the president a liar? Because the pre Bush had lied us into Iraq. He had lied about weapons of mass destruction, chemical belts around Baghdad. Colin Powell had gone. A general, Colin Powell, had gone to the U.N. and held up this little uh, vial and said, this is anthrax and it could kill so many people. And this is what Saddam Hussein is going to do to his people. And, uh, and it was all a lie. Everything about it was a lie. And uh, so I said, well, why, why don't you just call him a liar? Just, you know, shorthand it and call him a liar. That's what he is. And Biden said to me, why do you have to pick the hardest thing to do? You cannot call the president of the United States a liar. So they have this this issue around uh, calling liars liars when they're the president of the United States. However, uh, Bob Corker did everything but use the L word. He's disingenuous. It's demonstrably false. He has a tough relationship with the truth. He's uh, he's, he's scary. He's, he's, he's uh, an embarrassment. He debases the country. Uh, he is, uh, you know, unstable enough to start World War III. He, uh, you know, uh, upends everything that, uh, you know, is going well. And, and they've had enough, which is so interesting because they didn't have enough when he said John McCain wasn't a war hero. They didn't he, they didn't have enough when uh, he put Flynn as the national security advisor. And Michael Flynn and his son were retweeting white nationalist, white supremacist fake news that we find out was created by Russia and disseminated by troll farms in St. Petersburg and bots and the Mercer family paid for it and Jared Kushner was head of... None of this bothered them. It's so interesting. They don't have a problem with the fact that Kelly lied to the press yes, or the day before yesterday. They don't have a problem with that. That didn't make him come and go uncorked. He didn't have a problem with the um, 
hey, I, I, I got to pop some Tic Tacs, you know, because I just start kissing them because you could grab women by the P word when you're a star. I just uh, can't stop myself. They didn't have a problem with that. They didn't have a problem with a Muslim ban, a complete violation of the First Amendment. Uh, they didn't have a problem with him tweeting about the NFL, another complete dismissal of the First Amendment rights that we all serve for. Uh, he didn't have a problem. Well, I will say Corker had a problem when he called white Nazis, when he called Nazis and white supremacists, uh, some were good people. Corker did say that uh, there were no good white Nazis, uh, there were no good Nazis, and that, that, you know, he was unfit to be president then. That was Corker's cutoff, uh, you know, at least back then. Uh, but the president was just about to go to Capitol Hill. And Corker's all over the TV this morning, all over the TV, saying the president wants to divide. The president can't tell the truth. The president isn't suitable for your children to listen to. The president, uh, you know, is, is, is an embarrassment. He's a threat to uh, g global stability. All this, all this. And then the president goes up to the Senate side of, of Capitol Hill. And I don't know what happened in that lunch meeting, but it must have been a doozy because when the president leaves senator jeff flake from arizona gets on the senate floor and gives a 17 minute floor speech saying that our silence on this as republicans is not acceptable the president is a liar the president is dangerous the president is unfit his behavior is bizarre 17 minutes long 17 i i i think i think uh, we ought to play the whole thing because you will this was a his, an historic moment if i'm going to be grammatically correct for you grammarians out there which doesn't matter right now <clears throat> We have a mutiny of the president's own party underway. I'll just, I'm going to play you just an excerpt here, just a little brief snippet, just a taste, just a touch. And then you're going to say, I want to hear the whole thing. I know it. So this is what I'm going to I'm going to prime your carburetor, okay? Watch. When we remain silent and fail to act, when we know that silence and inaction is the wrong thing to do because of political considerations, because we might make enemies, because we might alienate the base, because we might provoke a primary challenge, because ad infinitum, ad nauseum, when we succumb to those considerations in spite of what should be greater considerations and imperatives in defense of our institutions and our liberty, we dishonor our principles and forsake our obligations. Those things are far more important than politics. Now, I'm aware that more politically savvy people than I will caution against such talk. I am aware that there is a segment of my party that believes that anything short of, of complete and unquestioning loyalty to a president who belongs to my party is unacceptable and suspect. Oof. If I have been critical, it is not because I relish criticizing the behavior of the president of the United States. If I have been critical, it is because I believe it is my obligation to do so, and as a matter and duty of conscience. The notion that one should stay silent and the, as the norms and values that keep America strong are undermined, and as the alliances and agreements that ensure the stability of the entire world are routinely threatened by the level of thought that goes into 140 characters. Mm. The notion that we should say or do nothing in the face of such mercurial behavior is a historic and I believe profoundly misguided. That was like toward the end of his speech. I, I really think you need to hear this. And uh, I, so I'm going to uh, step aside here and you can listen to this with me and then we can discuss what's really going on here, okay? This is Senator Jeff Flake uh, rising on the Senate floor to address a matter that he says has been on his mind. He said the democracy, our democracy is uh, 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 in dysfunction and he can't stay quiet, okay? Just listen to this. At a moment when it seems that our democracy is more defined by our discord and our dysfunction 
than by our own values and principles. Uh, let me begin by noting a somewhat obvious point, that these offices that we hold are not ours indefinitely. We're not here simply to mark time. Sustained incumbency is certainly not the point of seeking office, and there are times when we must risk our careers in favor of our principles. Now is such a time. It must also be said that I rise today with no small measure of regret. Regret because of the state of our disunion. Regret because of the disrepair and destructiveness of our politics. Regret because of the indecency of our discourse. Regret because of the coarseness of our leadership. Regret for the compromise of our moral authority. And by our, I mean all of our, complicity in this alarming and dangerous state of affairs. It is time for our complicity and our accommodation of the unacceptable to end. In this century, a new phrase has entered the language to describe the accommodation of a new and undesirable order, that phrase being the new normal. But we must never adjust to the present coarseness of our national dialogue with the tone set at the top. We must never regard as normal the regular and casual undermining of our democratic norms and ideals. We must never meekly accept the daily sundering of our country. The personal attacks, the threats against principles, freedoms and institution, the flagrant disregard for truth and decency, the reckless provocations, most often for the pettiest and most personal reasons, reasons having nothing whatsoever to do with the fortunes of the people that we have been elected to serve. None of these appalling features of our current politics should ever be regarded as normal. We must never allow ourselves to lapse into thinking that that is just the way things are now. If we simply become inured to this condition, thinking that it is just, it is just politics as usual, then heaven help us. Without fear of the consequences and without consideration of the rules of what is politically safe or palatable, we must stop pretending that the de degradation of our politics and the conduct of some in our executive branch are normal. They are not normal. Reckless, outrageous, and undignified behavior has become excused and countenanced as telling it like it is when it is actually just reckless, outrageous, and, and undignified. And when such behavior emanates from the top of our government, it is something else. It is dangerous to a democracy. Such behavior does not project strength because our strength comes from our values. It instead projects a corruption of the spirit and weakness. It is often said that children are watching. Well, they are. And what are we going to do about that? When the next generation asks us, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you speak up? What are we going to say? Wow. Mr. President, I rise today to say enough. Wow. We must dedicate ourselves to making sure that the anomalous never becomes the normal. <laughs> With respect and humility, I must say that we have fooled ourselves for long enough that a pivot to governing is right around the corner, a return to civility, civility and stability right behind it. We know better than that. By now, we all know better than that. Here today, I stand to say that we would be better served. We would better serve the country by better fulfilling our obligations under the Constitution by adhering to our Article I old normal, Mr. Madison's doctrine of separation of powers. This genius innovation which affirms Madison's status as a true visionary and for which Madison argued in Federalist 51, held that the equal branches of our government would balance and counteract with each other if necessary. Ambition counteracts ambition, he wrote. But what happens if ambition fails to counteract ambition? What happens if stability fails to assert itself in the face of chaos and instability? If decency fails to call out indecency? Were the shoe on the other foot, 
We Republicans, would we Republicans meekly accept such behavior on display from dominant Democrats? Of course we wouldn't, and we would be wrong if we did. When we remain silent and fail to act, when we know that silence and inaction is the wrong thing to do because of political considerations, because we might make enemies, because we might alienate the base, because we might provoke a primary challenge, because ad infinitum, ad nauseum, when we succumb to those considerations in spite of what should be greater considerations and imperatives in defense of our institutions and our liberty, we dishonor our principles and forsake our obligations. Those things are far more important than politics. Now, I'm aware that more politically savvy people than I will caution against such talk. I'm aware that there is a segment of my party that believes that anything short of of complete and unquestioning loyalty to a president who belongs to my party is unacceptable and suspect. If I have been critical, it is not because I relish criticizing the behavior of the President of the United States. If I have been critical, it is because I believe it is my obligation to do so, and as a matter and duty of conscience. The notion that one should stay silent and that as the norms and values that keep America strong are undermined and as the alliances and agreements that ensure the stability of the entire world are routinely threatened by the level of thought that goes into 140 characters. Mm, mm, mm. The notion that we should say or do nothing in the face of such mercurial behavior is a historic and I believe profoundly misguided. A president, a Republican president named Roosevelt had this to say about the president and a citizen's relationship in, to the office. Quote, the president is merely the most important among a large number of public servants. He should be supported or opposed exactly to the degree which is warranted by his good conduct or bad conduct, his efficiency or inefficiency in rendering loyal, able, and disinterested service to the nation as a whole. He continued, therefore, it is absolutely necessary that there, should be, or that, that there should be a full liberty to tell the truth about his acts. And this means that it is exactly as necessary to blame him when he does wrong as to praise him when he does right. Any other attitude in an American citizen is both base and servile. President Roosevelt continued to announce that there must be no criticism of the president or that we are to stand by a president, right or wrong, is not only unpatriotic and servile, but is morally treasonable to the American public." Unquote. Acting on conscience and principle in a manner is the manner in which we express our moral selves, and as such, loyalty to conscience and principle should supersede loyalty to any man or party. We can all be forgiven for failing in that measure from time to time, I certainly put myself at the top of the list of those who fall short in this regard. I am holier than none. But too often we rush to salvage principle, not to salvage principle, but to forgive and excuse our failures so that we might accommodate them and go right on failing until the accommodation itself becomes our principle. In that way and over time, we can justify almost any behavior and sacrifice any principle. I'm afraid that this is where we now find ourselves. Jesus. When a leader correctly identifies real hurt and insecurity in our country and instead of addressing it goes to look for someone to blame, there is perhaps nothing more devastating to a pluralistic society. Leadership knows that most often a good place to start in assigning blame is to look somewhat closer to home Leadership knows where the buck stops. Humility helps. Character counts. Hmm. Leadership does not knowingly encourage or feed ugly or debased appetites in us. Leadership lives by the American creed, e pluribus unum, from many one. American leadership looks to the world and just as Lincoln did, sees the family of man. Humanity is not a zero-sum game. When we have been 
at our most prosperous, we have been at our most principled. And when we do well, the rest of the world does well. These articles of civic faith have been critical to the American identity for as long as we have been alive. They are our birthright and our obligation. We must guard them jealously and pass them on for as long as the calendar has days. To betray them or to be unserious in their defense is a betrayal of the fundamental obligations of American leadership. And to behave as if they don't matter is simply not who we are. Now, the efficacy of American leadership around the globe has come into question. When the United States emerged from World War II, we contributed about half of the world's economic activity. It would have been easy to secure our dominance, keeping those countries who had been defeated or greatly weakened during the war in their place. We didn't do that. It would have been easy to focus inward. We resisted those impulses. Instead, we financed reconstruction of shattered, of shattered countries and created international organizations and institutions that have helped provide security and, prosper and foster prosperity around the world for more than 70 years. Now it seems that we, the architects of this visionary, rules-based world order that has brought so much freedom and prosperity, are the ones most eager to abandon it. The implications of this abandonment are profound, and the beneficiaries of this rather radical departure in the American approach to the world are the ideological enemies of our values. Despotism loves a vacuum, and our allies are now looking elsewhere for leadership. Oh, Jesus. Why are they doing this? None of this is normal. And what do we, as United States Senators, have to say about it? The principles that underlie our politics, the values of our founding, are too vital to our identity and to our survival to allow them to be compromised by the requirements of politics. Because politics can make us silent when we should speak, and silence can equal complicity. I have children and grandchildren to answer to, and so, Mr. President, I will not be complicit or silent. I've decided that I would be better able to represent the people of Arizona and to better serve my country and my conscience by freeing myself of the political consideration that consumed far too much bandwidth and would cause me to compromise far too many principles. To that end, I am announcing today that my service in the Senate will conclude at the end of my term in early January 2019. Mm -mm -mm. It is clear at this moment that a traditional conservative who believes in limited government and free markets, who is devoted to free trade, who is pro-immigration, has a narrower and narrower path to nomination in the Republican Party, the party that has so long defined itself by its belief in those things. It is also clear to me for the moment that we have given in or given up on the core principles in favor of a more viscerally satisfying anger and resentment. Mm. To be clear, the anger and resentment that the people feel at the royal mess that we've created are justified. Thank you. But anger and resentment are not a governing philosophy. There is, undi and there is an undeniable potency to a populist appeal by mischaracterizing or misunderstanding our problems and giving in to the impulse to scapegoat and belittle the impulse to scapegoat and belittle threatens to turn us into a fearful, backward-looking people. In the case of the Republican Party, those things also threaten to turn us into a fearful, backward-looking minority party. Hmm. We were not made great as a country by indulging in or even exalting our worst impulses, turning against ourselves, glorifying in the things that divide us, and calling fake things true and true things fake. Oh, my God. And we did not become the beacon of freedom in the darkest corners of the world by flouting our institutions and failing to understand just how hard won and vulnerable they are. This spell will eventually break. That is my belief. We will return to ourselves once more, and I say the sooner the better. Because we have a felt healthy government, we must also have healthy, healthy 
and functioning parties. We must respect each other again in an atmosphere of shared facts shared. and shared values, comity, and good faith. We must argue our positions fervently and never be afraid to compromise. We must assume the best of our fellow man and always look for the good. Until that day comes, we must be unafraid to stand up and speak out as if our country depends on it, because it does. Oh my God. I plan to spend the remaining 14 months of my Senate term doing just that. Mr. President, the graveyard is full of indispensable men and women. None of us here is indispensable. Nor were even the great figures of history who toiled at these very desks in this very chamber to shape the country that we have inherited. What is indispensable are the values that they consecrated in Philadelphia and in this place. Values which have endured and will endure for so long as men and women wish to remain free. What is indispensable is what we do here in defense of those values. A political career does not mean much if we are complicit in undermining these values. Mm. I thank my colleagues for indulging me here today. I will close by borrowing the words of President Lincoln, who knew more about healthy enmity and preserving our founding values than any other American who has ever lived. His words from his first inaugural were a prayer in his time and are now no less in ours. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break the bonds of our affection. The mystic cords of memory will swell when again touched, as surely as they will be, by the better angels of our nature. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Wow. Wow, that was amazing. And if it moved you, it should, because here you have a Republican from Arizona who serves alongside John McCain, who suffered through this John McCain's not a war hero and all the attacks that uh, Trump made on his uh, dear friend, John McCain, uh, in order to remain a stalwart Republican. And something along the way has snapped and broken uh, between the Republican Party and this president, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, I, I can pretty much tell you that it's this, uh, it's it's the struggle to get the tax cuts that I think have, you know, put them over the edge because they realize, they realize that uh, this probably won't happen either, that this president is such a liar that his word means so little uh, that they will fail at this uh, tax cut and that Steve Bannon uh, and the other white nationalists around him, the, uh, you know, Jason Millers and President Trump himself will primary them or whatever. And they've just had it with staying quiet about the lying, the the, the threat to our nation. The, and, and, and this is what Bob Corker said the other day. Bob Corker said the other day that all of his colleagues or most of his colleagues knew that this was true that what Bob Corker was saying a couple of days ago about the adult daycare center and then before that at Charlottesville where the president will, just doesn't have the maturity, he just doesn't have the intellect or the will uh, to be presidential in, in, in times of uh, distress or whatever, uh, and that all or most of his Republican colleagues knew that that was true. And now we're seeing that, it, that, that, that Jeff Flake knows that that is true. We're seeing that Ben Sasse of Nebraska knows that that is true. We're seeing that uh, Susan Collins of Maine knows that that is true. John McCain knows that that is true. I mean, one after the other, after the other, the only person, and this is sick and twisted, but this should sh show you what the swamp really is, what the swamp feels like, looks like, sounds like, smells like. It smells like, looks like, tastes like Mitch McConnell. Yes, gross, I know. Because Mitch McConnell expressed to Jeff Flake right after that amazing speech that he was sorry that Jeff Flake didn't want to serve anymore. But, uh, you know, this is uh, the Senate and, you know, bye bye, we'll get somebody else. I mean, it's, it was so sick. It was so twisted. McConnell is going to be the beck and call girl of the lying, debasing, dividing, 
demagogue that is Donald Trump. He's going to be his beck and call girl. He's going to do whatever to kiss that man's giant, giant butt. It's just so it's such a, a, a look into who are the principled, who have had enough only because of the taxes. But who, you know, really gives a damn about, uh, you know, uh, uh, eating everything that this president is serving? So I just want you to know that after this speech, Mitch McConnell, you know, got on the floor and said, you know, okay, bye bye, you know, uh, too bad. And that Steve Bannon, swear to God, has claimed victory. He actually said these words that he has claimed another scalp. And that Jeff Flake was a person he was after and he had claimed another scalp in his war <clears throat> on his own party. So he's thrilled. He's thrilled that uh, Corker isn't running for re-election. He's thrilled that, uh, you know, uh, 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 um, Flake isn't running for re-election. He's thrilled that uh, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski have been denigrated. He's thrilled to see that he's punching back punching back a man who is fighting the most aggressive form of brain cancer whose life you know listen mccain's policies bomb 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 moran i'm not down with those okay i'm not tax cuts to the rich in a time of war uh being sold to me by a guy who was a pow in vietnam was a little hard to swallow was a little difficult to take you know uh, nominating sarah palin or picking sarah palin to be his vice presidential candidate putting a guy that we now know was a lobbyist for russian interests rick davis in charge of his campaign and then rick davis's partner paul manafort ends up being trump's campaign man it's a little too close for comfort but in the waning twilight of john mccain's life he is trying to stand up and tell you something and i would beg that people listen i would beg that people listen to jeff flake today who said he cannot tell his children or his grandchildren that this president is normal he can't do it there is nothing normal about the way he operates. There's nothing normal about his his bearing, his being, his his tweeting, his his you know uh, 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 fire and fury to North Korea, to putting us in harm's way every single day. There is nothing normal. Up th There's nothing normal about attacking a gold star widow. Nothing. Nothing normal about that. And then to send out John Kelly, to double down, to show that Trump fights back against war widows is sick now i don't know what the incident was i got a feeling it's this tax crap because trump went up to capitol hill today to talk to them about that and then all this crap happened but i don't know what it was i will tell you there is a, a mountain of things that have happened that they stayed silent about that they didn't feel this compunction to call to principle the call to character they didn't feel that their granddaughters and their you know mothers had to be protected from you know uh, uh, donald trump and and, and his uh, sexually harassing ways and threatening to sue the women even harvey weinstein sort of semi apologizes to them this man just keeps on attacking people who have been harmed by him. People who have lost something important to them or have had one of the most significant moments of their adult lives because of him. He trashes them because they say that they are forever changed by his brutish behavior. They are forever changed by his non-intellectual curiosity about, uh, you know, uh, uh, missions in uh, Yemen. The first one. Remember the first one? I bet nobody even remembers this, this, this chief petty officer that you were so in love with that he sacrificed because he, he, he Obama had the, the plan for that uh, Yemen raid and didn't go ahead with it. Donald Trump was president for what, five days? And he ordered that uh, this, this, this raid in Yemen go forward and we lost chief petty officer William Owens? and called it a success and now we have a replay in niger except this time nobody's going quietly into that good night they want their questions answered i don't know if it's a culmination of everything that has broken them down or if it's just politics and they know that they're being targeted i don't know go to randyroads.com for the whole thing and a podcast buy a stinking podcast